Our next guest, we're so happy to have him join us today. Uh, Ken Gerhardt is a widely recognized cryptozoologist and author who is featured on a multitude of television programs. He has traveled the world searching for evidence of mysterious creatures including Bigfoot, the Loch Ness Monster, the Chupacabra, Mothman, Thunderbirds, and Werewolves. Ken has written several books and articles on the subject of unknown animals, and his research has been featured on numerous TV shows including Monster Quest, Ancient Aliens, and Texas Country Reporter. He's appeared on major networks including CBS, Animal Planet, Sci-Fi, Travel Channel, National Geographic, and the Science Channel. Is that all? Really? I'm just kidding. <laughs> Most recently, he was a co-host of the History Channel series, Missing in Alaska. Ladies and gentlemen, Ken Gerhardt. Thank you, Brandy. Well, it's absolutely an honor and a pleasure to be here speaking at the 6th Annual Granbury Paranormal Expo. And I gotta say, guys, I travel all over the place and I do a lot of events around. And I've been very impressed. This is a fabulous event, really well done. And I wanna, you know, give thanks to uh, Brandy, her, and uh, Coletta, and all the people that put this on. Can we get a round of applause, please, for, for Brandy for putting this great event together? Thank you. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about, um, should I stand back so that people in the back can see me better? Is that, can you see? I'll be as elusive as the things that I seek here and I'll just kind of hide a little bit. But um, So can I get a show of hands? How many people are familiar with the term cryptozoology? Okay, so pretty much all of my folks here under the pavilion. For those of you that don't know, Cryptozoology is the study of hidden animals, and that's a very fancy and technical way of saying that we search for evidence of animals, creatures that have, are unrecognized by science. And um, of course, many of these are often mythological uh, or currently mythological beasts, things like Bigfoot, the Yeti, the Loch Ness Monster, the Chupacabra, um, and the list goes on and on. There's literally a myriad of mystery beasts that have been reported around the world. And I often like to remind people that, um, you know, the process of discovery is ongoing. There are about 5,000 new species that are described every year by scientists. Just think about that for a second, 5,000 a year. And of course, most of those are very small, things like fish and invertebrates and so forth. But occasionally we do find something large and remarkable um, in the vast corners, uh, wilderness areas of our planet. And bearing that out, I also like to remind people that about 46% of the Earth's land surface is still considered wilderness area. So just think about all of the remote mountain ranges and deserts, jungles, forests, swamps, tundra. There are a lot of places where people don't go very often just because it's not very uh, hospitable to humans. And of course, you know, that's not even to mention, you know, three quarters of the Earth's surface is covered by deep ocean that averages 12,000 feet deep. And new species are being discovered in the ocean all the time, including whales. So anyways, that's a, kind of a synopsis of cryptozoology. Now, for this event today, I'm going to be talking specifically about the monsters of Texas. And monster is, again, kind of a romantic term that we use. The technical word is cryptid, and a cryptid is something that I investigate. It's an unknown animal or creature. And befitting of the great size of Texas, we have um, a vast array of mystery creatures that have been reported here, and also legends. So I'm going to be talking about a few of those. I don't know if I'll get a chance to cover all of them. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and start with Bigfoot, of course, because Bigfoot is wildly popular, one of the most popular subjects that we investigate. And number of successful TV shows and so forth. Um, so, Texas, believe it or not, ranks seventh of all these states in the in the lower 48. We rank seventh in the number of Bigfoot sightings. Most of the sightings come from uh, Washington State, California, Oregon. Those are the top three on the Pacific Coast. And then there are a lot of sightings from Florida and Ohio. In Florida, it's called the Skunk Ape. In Ohio, it's called the Grass Man. And um, then we also have um, Michigan and some other places in the Midwest, but Texas has a lot of sightings of Bigfoot. And um, so it seems to be a phenomenon that's all over. Now the oldest Bigfoot stories in Texas date back to 1837, something called the Wild Man of the Navidad. 
And the name Bigfoot is actually a fairly current name. It was created by the media in 1958. So long before the name Bigfoot existed, people around the world that saw these things would refer to them as wild men because they were man-like, they walked upright on their hind legs. Of course, they're allegedly very hairy, covered in hair. And they are wild. They live typically in the wilderness, in the forest, in the places where humans don't go. So wild man is actually a term that you can find all over the world in different legends and cultures that talk about these Bigfoot-like creatures. But in 1837, uh, in the little town, near the little town of Sublime, Texas, which is about halfway between San Antonio and Houston, um, kind of south of I-10 there, um, on the lower, and this is in Lavaca County, on the lower Navidad River, um, back in 1837, people began to find, in that little town, began to find footprints, human-like footprints, in the sandbars around the Navidad River. And around that same time period, people were also reporting that something was breaking into their barns, into their houses, and stealing food and other provisions. And it wasn't long before people began to report seeing these hairy, man-like creatures running around. Um, and there was, a, of course, uh, they were very elusive and people were looking for them. And uh, there was an, a, one alleged incident where some men on horseback actually rode up on one of these hairy, man-like creatures and tried to lasso it and capture it, but were unsuccessful. Um, there is another aspect of the mystery that refers to the wild woman of the Navidad because these creatures were often seen in pairs and ultimately one of them vanished and it was believed that the other one may have been a female. And um, one thing that's notable is that they weren't described as being really, really big and massive like Bigfoot typically is. They were described as being man-like height but covered in hair and uh, having human-sized footprints. So that's the oldest story that we find in the state of Texas. Um, the most famous account of a Bigfoot-like creature in Texas is something known as the Lake Worth Monster or the Lake Worth Goat Man. I know some of you are from the Fort Worth area or are familiar with Lake Worth. Um, adjacent to Lake Worth is the Greer Island Nature Center, which you can still go visit to this day. It's a pretty cool spot. They have bison running around and stuff. But back in July 10th, 1969, Three couples were parked out by the Greer Island Nature Center by Lake Worth and were, um, you know, enjoying the, the moonlight out there by the lake. And um, according to these people, because they rushed to the police department shortly after this incident, something jumped out of one of the trees onto the hood of a car, one of the cars, and tried to abduct uh, one of the young ladies and actually scratched up one of the cars. So the couples drove in a, in a frenzy, in a panic, to the local sheriff's department and reported their encounter with the creature, and they described it as a quote-unquote scaly goat man, which is kind of a weird description. Uh, but four police cars uh, responded to the scene, and they didn't find any trace of the thing. Although they knew that they had been getting reports for many uh, weeks and allegedly, according to some months and years, of a strange creature lurking around Lake Worth. Um, so the following night, this actually made the Fort Worth uh, newspaper, and the article in fact was written by a gentleman named Jim Mars, who's very, very well known for writing books about UFOs and conspiracies, and actually writing the screenplay or the treatment for G the movie JFK. Uh, Mr. Mars unfortunately passed away recently. He was highly regarded in the field of unexplained phenomenon in Texas, but he was a newspaper reporter at that time. So the story made the local newspaper, and then the following evening, July 11th, 1969, a group of about 30 to 40 uh, self-appointed monster hunters um, went out to the lake, as you might expect they would, armed with rifles and clubs and different things to try to encounter or trap or find this Lake Worth monster. Um, and lo and behold, they heard some moanful cries, and um, thank you, Tony. Thought that might be a bad omen that my name was floating away there. Um, <coughs> and suddenly this giant, according to the people that were present, this giant hulking hair-covered creature, very ape-like, covered in white fur, um, climbed up to the top of a bluff in an area called the pit and threw, picked up a giant uh, spare tire and threw it at the crowd of 30 or 40 onlookers 
And uh, apparently quite a distance, like 100 feet, or I mean, sorry, 100 yards, when it was kind of bouncing. And this caused everybody in the, that was there to scatter to their cars and take off and get out of there, including some sheriff's deputies who were on duty. So that, if that incident is true, that's pretty notable because there aren't any other Bigfoot accounts or sightings on record that have 30 to 40 eyewitnesses. Um, subsequently, a local woman named Sally Ann Clark, who lived in Fort Worth, who was an aspiring detective and writer, decided to go out and talk to some of the people that have had experiences and sightings of the Lake Worth monster. It was a big deal there for a long time. People were going out to the lake on a regular basis and trying to see this thing. And she wrote a book called The Lake Worth Monster, which is, uh, it, it can be found online and so forth, but uh, it includes some of the eyewitness reports of the monster at that time. And she also added in some fictional kind of fantasy sightings of the creature as well. So it's kind of like half fiction, half uh, nonfiction kind of book. Um, so sightings dropped off dramatically at the end of 1969. In November of 1969, a local business owner named Alan Plaster snapped a fuzzy photograph of a giant white something standing in the grass near Lake Worth. Uh, it's very, you know, it's a very ambiguous photo, but it's uh, well known and you can find copies of that if you want to check it out. And um, also, the final sighting, known sighting of the Lake Worth monster, happened when a gentleman named Charles Buchanan was sleeping in the back of his the bed of his pickup truck by the lake one night and he claimed that the monster climbed into the bed of his truck and tried to drag him out from his sleeping bag and uh, thinking quickly he grabbed a bag of chicken that he had had for dinner the leftovers and he stuffed it in this in the face of this Lake Worth monster and according to Buchanan the monster took the chicken into his mouth and jumped in the lake and swam away so kind of a funny story um, I investigated Lake Worth back in 2003 with my colleague Nick Redfern and we were just, just wanted to go check the area out for fun. The local rangers who I spoke to were convinced that the Lake Worth monster was not real, that it was simply a, a prank or a hoax that was being pulled on by teenagers that had a, an ape costume. And in truth, there may have been some of that going on around that time. Um, but Nick and I did find a curious teepee-like structure out there on Greer Island when we were looking around, and those are the types of things that we often find in areas where Bigfoot is alleged to be. So the description of a goat man, I think that comes from the original report. I'm not sure exactly why the, the witnesses said that, but um, the, the overall description of Lake Worth Monster is a big, hairy, ape-like creature on its hind legs, which is basically what a Bigfoot sounds like. And it was said to be covered in white hair, which is rare, but not totally unusual. There have been sightings and accounts of white-haired Bigfoots. Um, so that's the Lake Worth monster. Now, most of the sightings of Bigfoot in Texas happen in the far eastern quadrant of the state. So, like I said, we do have a lot of sightings and reports here in Texas, but most of those are in the areas uh, along the Sabine River on the border with Louisiana, ranging all the way from the northern part of the state all the way down to the coast. There are also a lot of sightings in the Big Thicket, which is an area I did a lot of research, a uh, very inaccessible area in the southeast. Um, there are many sightings along the Trinity River corridor, all the way up and down the state. Um, but sightings outside of that area are more rare, so we don't have a lot of sightings uh, west of I-45. Most of those seem to be east of I-45. Now I, do, I did bring with me one artifact which is a alleged cast of a big footprint that was made in uh, Sam Houston National Forest near Conroe. This was made by a colleague of mine, Jan uh, February 2001, a guy named Ram Trusty found this footprint. And um, we make these casts, of course, by pouring plaster or some type of uh, substrate into the uh, indention. And then when it hardens and dries, we pull it out. Now, What's interesting about this big footprint is that it looks very similar to Bigfoot casts that have been found and authenticated in places like California, Washington, and so forth. And what I, I've often told people is that although it looks superficially similar to a human footprint, it's actually very different. There's no arch. Uh, big footprint is a big, broad, square thing with an elongated, widened heel. The toes are more flexible than ours, and uh, they're more uniform in size from the big toe to the small toe. And physical anthropologists who have studied these casts at length 
have determined that this is exactly the kind of foot that would belong to an 800 pound, eight foot tall hominid that walked through the wilderness. And uh, so it, it, it's basically, it's adapted or evolved feet that are very different from ours because they're much bigger and heavier than they are, than we are. They have a more flexible foot than we do, but they walk flat footed. So they don't go heel to toe. They basically, it's like they're cross country skiing. And they never straighten there. If you've ever seen the Patterson Gimlin film, the famous footage from 1967, which is almost 50 years old now, the subject in the film doesn't straighten its leg ever. It always has a 15 degree angle on its knees when it's walking. So it, it uh, Sasquatch seems to be some type of upright hominid um, that is basically very big and heavy <laughs> and has evolved with bipedal, a bipedal gait, an upright gait. Um, let me see. So like I said, we don't have a lot of Bigfoot sightings west of I-45, but there's an interesting uh, case from out near El Paso. So El Paso is probably the last place you would ever expect to hear about a Bigfoot type of creature, but there have been some sightings out there in a place called Horizon City, which is just outside El Paso. And uh, the Horizon City monster is a Bigfoot, sounds like a Bigfoot type creature. It's about seven feet tall, very massive and hairy, but it's described as having kind of a, a jutting uh, prognathic jaw, kind of more like a dog or uh, you know some apes and um, it was it's been reported since the 1970s it was cited by some teenagers on a golf course and then in 2002 uh, a local woman claimed to have seen it a couple of times so that's basically an unexpected habitat for a bigfoot or sasquatch when you're talking about desert most sightings of bigfoot or sasquatch creatures worldwide and we have to say worldwide because not only do we have bigfoot or Sasquatch here in North America. There's also the Yeti of the Himalayas in Asia. The Chinese have something called the Yeren in Australia. It's called the Yawi. Um, in Europe, there are accounts of wild men, even down into Central and South America. So one of the really compelling things I tell people, and for those of you that are skeptical, and by the way, I encourage skepticism. I think it's a very important part of this type of research. You have to be objective. You can't accept everything as being true and real. For those of you that are disbelievers in Bigfoot and Sasquatch, well, how could something like that exist? We've never found one, blah, blah, blah. Yes, that's true, and that is pretty mind-blowing. But here's what I always tell people about Bigfoot and Sasquatch, because if you immerse yourself in the research like I have and like others have, there's literally a mountain of anecdotal evidence. So here it is. There are, at this point, at least 5,000 documented reports of Bigfoot on record. Um, I've investigated, personally, dozens of people who claim to have seen them, and these people are extremely sincere and credible. Many of them are lifelong outdoorsmen and hunters uh, in Texas and elsewhere. So thousands of eyewitness sightings on record, very consistent physical descriptions across the board, seven to eight feet tall, very hulking with broad shoulders, no neck, uh, covered in hair, long arms, um, very smelly and very vocal, apparently. Um, there are native legends in different cultures all over the world that talk about wild men and Bigfoot type creatures that date back hundreds of years. There are Native American um, artifacts that look like apes. And since there are no apes in North America, you wonder how these ancient totems and artifacts in North America look like apes. That's curious. And then we have the physical evidence, which consists of the cast that I showed you, many casts like that. Um, there is the Patterson film, which is the famous footage I talked about from 1967. I personally, I disregard all the other photographs and videos I've seen look like fakes or uh, they're just too ambiguous, but the Patterson film has, has never been disproven. And guys, if you think about uh, those of you who are my age or older, think about what costumes, ape costumes, looked like in 1967. And then I urge you to go look at that footage where you can actually see the muscles flexing underneath the fur and the breasts swinging and looking very natural and everything about it looking completely natural, not unfake at all. So. To this day, no one's been able to explain or reproduce that footage, even using modern technology. So that's, that's all very convincing. 
And then on top of that, you have um, some hair samples that have been found allegedly that are kind of curious, some droppings and things like that. So if you look at the whole compendium of all of that evidence together, it builds at least a convincing argument that there could be a large bipedal hominid, and I, by, when I say that, I don't mean there's just one. Obviously, there's, there are a whole bunch of them living in the remote areas of our planet. And the last thing I want to leave you with is that um, after many, many years of research, I've come to the conclusion, as many other researchers have, that the reason we haven't found Bigfoot or Sasquatch is because they're extremely intelligent, sentient beings, maybe not as smart as us, but very, very smarter than any other animal, and that they've adapted behavior patterns specifically to avoid us. We're their competition. We're competing for the same niche as hominids. Um, there are fossils that look like Bigfoot. That was the last thing I, I forgot to mention in my evidence rundown. There was a giant ape called Gigantopithecus that lived in Asia 100,000 years ago. It stood about 10 feet tall and it probably looked very much like Bigfoot. And there were other things that looked like Bigfoot in our fossil history. So um, if they're very intelligent and if they've adapted over thousands of years and if they've figured out we're going to go live where humans don't live, in the most remote areas. We're going to move around mostly at night and be nocturnal because humans aren't. And we're you know, going to heighten our senses and our awareness so that we can avoid humans. So that if a human's approaching and we can hear them or we can sense them, we're going to move away from them. So that would explain certainly why they have avoided being found. There would have to be, according to scientists, at least thousands of them to have a viable breeding population with enough genetic diversity and stuff. So I know that's hard to accept, but, um, well, there it is. So, you know, I, 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 th I think they're out there, and I think it's just a matter of time before hopefully we find some remains, or I certainly don't endorse anyone trying to go out and, and harm one or catch one or anything like that. They're, peaceful creatures that are curious about us, um, but I'm sure they would be territorial if we approached them, um, which would be very hard to do. Okay, so that's my Bigfoot spiel. I spent a little bit more time on that than I wanted to. So now I'm gonna move on to uh, my number two Texas cryptid, which is going to be the Chupacabra, which I'm sure many of you have heard of the Chupacabra, and I've uh, written about it and appeared on several TV shows that dealt with the Texas version of the Chupacabra. So the original name, the name Chupacabra, which is of course Spanish, means goat sucker. And uh, the original descriptions of the Chupacabra came out of Puerto Rico. You know, a moment of silence for Puerto Rico. I feel very, ter very terrible for those people right now. But um, in 1995, there were a spate of mysterious livestock killings on the island of Puerto Rico. So uh, farmers there were finding their goats and chickens and other animals dead uh, in the morning. And according to the livestock owners, the animals were, de the victims were devoid of blood, as if some vampire-like predator came in the dark of night. And oftentimes they would report two puncture wounds on the neck of the uh, animal carcass. So uh, long, shortly after that, people began to see this weird creature or report this weird creature that was described as being about three feet tall with a body like a kangaroo kind of reptilian with a row of spikes going down its back, big alien-like eyes, and a long forked tongue, and of course, sharp teeth and claws. So something that doesn't really fit anything we know of in the natural world, but those are the original descriptions and artist renditions of the Chupacabra. So um, it, it literally created a state of panic on the island of Puerto Rico to where the government got involved and they were forming different committees and task forces to go out and look for this thing. So that's when the Chupacabra first came to public notoriety. And coincidentally, that was about the same time period as this new thing that came out called the Internet. And so the Chupacabra was one of the first darlings of the Internet because there were websites popping up and people were getting online and for the first time and wow, wow, there's this weird creature down in Puerto Rico that sounds like a vampire. So that's the back history. Now, as far as Texas goes, in the spring of 2004, a poultry farmer just south of San Antonio where I live, a guy named Devin McAnally, began finding his chickens dead and uh, up to a dozen at a time. In the morning, he would go into the chicken coop and 12 of, the, 12 of his chickens had died and he wasn't finding any blood. And this was weird to Devin because he was used to dealing with coyotes and raccoons and skunks and other animals coming in and taking his chickens. 
for food and maybe killing them and eating them. But uh, this was whatever, something was coming in and killing his animals and leaving the bodies, bodies uh, seemingly bloodless. And around that same time period, Devin began to see a strange animal on his property. And he described it as looking, it was on four legs and it was kind of hopping through his property and it had kind of a bluish skin. And he, he couldn't tell what the heck it was. So he got a 22 rifle out of his house and he put it in the fork of a tree on his property so that the next time he saw it, he wouldn't have to run in to get his gun. And finally, he saw this thing out in his property eating some mulberries that fell from a tree, which I know, mulberry, you know, an animal eating mulberries, it doesn't really conjure images of a vampire-like creature. But regardless, he shot this thing, took a picture of it. He still couldn't tell what it was. It looked like a big rat with sharp, long fangs or something, long tail. And he asked his neighbors, uh, no one could tell or identify this animal. So he took a photo of it down to De Leon Market, which is an old Spanish market on the south side of San Antonio, and he put it on the bulletin board. Does anybody know what this is? And some of the old timers from Mexico looked at the picture and said, oh, it's the Chupacabra. We have those down in Mexico. I grew up with those in the 1950s and 30s and so forth. So that's where the name Chupacabra became associated with this animal in Texas. And um, ultimately the bones, uh, Devin actually buried the bones in his yard they were exhumed by none other than uh, Whitley Strieber, who wrote the book Communion, who's from San Antonio and is interested in all this stuff. So Whitley had the bones dug up. They took them to the San Antonio Zoo, where I'm a volunteer, and they looked at the bones and they said, oh, it's some kind of, it's a canid, so it's a dog-like animal, but it has a really weird teeth and it's kind of a strange looking skull. So that's the first Texas Chupacabra. It was known as the Elmendorf Beast, was the secondary name. Um, exactly one year later, there was a woman, I'm sorry, later in that year, I forgot about one was shot up near Pollock, Texas, uh, which is up near Lufkin, and that animal was look, looked really weird. It was hairless and blue skin, and it was a canid, but it had like deformed teeth and very hideous looking. When the people first saw it, they thought it was a giant rat or something. They couldn't tell what it was. So that was the second Texas Chupacabra. Then one year later in 2005, a woman named Phyllis Canyon, who's a good friend of mine, she lives down in Cuero, Texas. Similar to Devin, she was raising chickens and something was killing her chickens. And that's when she saw a strange animal on her property. And uh, that animal was ultimately hit by a car. And the neighbors called her one morning and said, hey, that animal you've been, look, that's been killing your chickens is out here on the highway. So she went and got it, dragged it back to her house. And then something really cool happened. Phyllis, uh, who's quite a character, uh, cut off its head and stuck it in her freezer because she thought it was had some value to it. And this made international news. Chupacabra, a woman has chupacabra head in her freezer. And um, uh, a few months after that, I was contacted by the TV show Monster Quest and they wanted me to do an episode on the Texas chupacabra. So I drove down and met Phyllis and I examined the skull and it was a weird looking, it was a canid. It looked like a dog, but its teeth were kind of weird. Its fangs were really long, extra long and it was missing all of its incisor teeth, and it was hairless, not, not, not any hair on its body at all. Maybe just a few sparkles. Um, so we did an episode on the Texas, on the Cuero Chupacabra. Um, after we finished filming, Phyllis found a second dead, quote unquote, Chupacabra on her property, and she actually had took this one to a taxidermist and had it mounted, and she's got it sitting in her, uh, in her living room, and you've probably seen that on a bunch of TV shows. It's a really weird looking animal. And um, then one year after that is the famous video footage, uh, also down in DeWitt County near where Phyllis lives, there was a police officer named Brandon Rydell who was on duty. And I'm sure you guys, many of you have seen this footage, but he was driving down a dirt road and this animal came out of the, the grass and began running in front of his car and he videotaped it with his dash cam and said, what the heck is this thing? So that's where the Texas Chupacabra began and grand, uh, came into notoriety. Um, in subsequent years, I've personally examined the remains of six of those animals. I have tissue samples and bones at my house. Um, all of the DNA tests that have been done have indicated these animals are definitively canids. They are either coyotes or wild dogs or hybrids with wolves, but they're all in the canid group family. But why are they called chupacabras? Well, they're the allegations that they were drinking the blood of chickens, which has never been proven. Um, something curious happens when an animal dies quickly. If an animal dies quickly, it doesn't necessarily bleed out if there's not a large wound. 
the blood will coagulate and harden in the lower part of the body and so it, there's an, an appearance that there's no blood there and that's perhaps where these farmers and ranchers thought oh something drank the blood uh, all the blood out of this chicken well it's still in the chicken but it just looks like there's no blood so then we wonder well why is the why are these animals these canids hairless that's the first question and there's a theory out there that they suffer from a condition known as mange which is a mite that gets on their hair and causes their hair to fall out um, anyone that's ever had a mangy dog knows that all of the hair doesn't fall out there are just patches and stuff so that's kind of curious um, why do they have strange teeth some of them have had disproportionate limbs uh, weird structures on their backside uh, Phyllis's animals were uh, actually born with only four nipples instead of six and had cataracts. So there are all these weird physical anomalies, but we know that these animals are canids. Um, and we know that they kill animals for no reason, which is an unusual behavior. So there's two prevalent theories. One is that these animals are sick or diseased in some way. And the second theory is that they are mutated, that there's some type of mutation going on or something like that. So um, I have, in subsequent years, like I said, people contact me all the time and say that they've seen these things, send me pictures. Uh, so far since I've been at this festival, I've spoken to at least three people who claim to have seen them. So it's a pretty common thing now. These, these animals are everywhere. Which brings up another interesting question. Why are these dog-like, hairless, dog-like, mutated animals suddenly appearing in vast numbers when we never heard of them before? The only correlation that I could find and I, you know, I don't want to make unfounded allegations here, but I did learn um, that most of the sightings of these Texas chupacabras correspond with the locations of coal-burning power plants. There's one down in Cuero. Um, there's one south of San Antonio. There's one up near Lufkin. Um, and the only thing I can conjecture is that maybe some of the toxins that are being emitted by these coal burning power plants because they're putting sulfur dioxide and lead and all kinds of things into the atmosphere is contaminating the water supplies in places where these wild dogs, coyotes and wild dogs live and it's causing them to either mutate or causing their hair to fall out or causing their immunity system to fail. So it's kind of sad actually, but maybe that's one theory is that we're looking at a mutation. So not a truly legendary beast in terms of Texas. And I'm sorry if I slayed anybody's dragon today by spoiling the, the Texas chupacabra for you, but there it is. Um, okay, so now I'm going to talk about probably my famous favorite Texas cryptid and something that I've investigated for many, many years. And it's called the Big Bird. And no, I'm not referring to Sesame Street. This is something, although that's where the name came from, because the media, who often invents names for cryptids, came up with that name, Big Bird. But the story of Big Bird goes back at least to the 1970s. And it started in the Rio Grande Valley, right across the border from Mexico. In January of 1976, people in, in and around Brownsville area began to report sightings and encounters with a giant winged creature that was described as being about as tall as a man with a wingspan at least 10, maybe 15 or 20 feet across. Some of the people described it as looking like a big unusual bird with feathers and a bald head. Other people said that this thing looked very prehistoric and maybe it wasn't a bird at all but some type of giant bat or a prehistoric pterosaur which is a prehistoric reptile that lived millions of years ago. Um, the most dramatic encounter happened on January 14, 1976, when a gentleman named Armando Grimaldo, who was up in Raymondville, was having a cigarette on his patio one night, and he heard the sound of flapping, large flapping wings, and looked up just in time to see this thing descending down on top of him. And he tried to run from it, and according to Armando, this thing came down and grabbed at him with his claws and ripped his clothes and he finally drove under a bush to safety and began to scream for help and his estranged wife and her mother came out of the house and they rushed him to the Willisee County Hospital where he was in a state of shock and was covered in visible wounds and scars. So that was the most famous account but there were many others around that time period over a several week period. 
The last Big Bird sighting of 1976 happened in my hometown of San Antonio, Texas, when three school teachers who were on their way to work one morning saw two giant flying creatures in the air and they pulled, down, pulled their cars over to the side of the road to get a look at these things because they couldn't believe what they were seeing. And they said that they were basically, these things had a 20 foot wingspan and that they looked like pterodactyls. They had bat-like wings with a giant crest on the top of their head. And this made the local San Antonio newspapers and the, unfortunately, the San Antonio school district quickly told the teachers to stop talking about it, you're freaking the students out, and so forth. Um, so I've investigated the Big Bird sightings, um, like I said, for about 15 or 20 years. I spent a lot of time in the Rio Grande Valley talking to some of the original eyewitnesses. Um, I still get reports um, in and around the valley and from the San Antonio area. And in fact, the area where the, t the three school teachers had their sighting, I uh, interviewed a woman and wrote about a woman named uh, Blanco Alivara who was leaving her job one day at the, the water treatment center and she claimed that a giant scary looking bird dive bombed her pickup truck, forcing her off the road. And then last year I was contacted by a woman who grew up down the street from where the school teachers had their sighting and she claimed that um, she saw the big bird basically the same day that the school teachers did and she ran in and told her parents but she hadn't talked about it for years and years. So there are many, many accounts of Big Bird all over Texas. There are even some up kind of in the Dallas area. Uh, a gentleman named Mike, uh, Mike Minadeo was driving um, through Mesquite, Texas a few years ago. He claims he saw the Big Bird. Um, there's a woman in Upshur County. Uh, I've written about many of these. So if you pick up any copies of my books, you'll read about the sightings of the Big Birds all over Texas. Um, so first of all, what is the big bird if it exists? Well, the largest known birds um, in modern times are things like the condor. Now we have a, a small population of condors out in California uh, and Arizona, Utah that are closely monitored. Condors are vulture-like birds that have a wingspan of about 10 feet across. Um, they're pretty big and scary looking birds, but they don't live in Texas. Um, other than that, we have some large storks and cranes and eagles that have wingspans like about eight feet across. But what people have described in the case of Big Bird is something with a wingspan of at least 12 or 15 feet across or more. So I personally think that some of the sightings and accounts of the Big Birds are possibly misidentifications of known animals. That maybe somebody did see a big stork or pelican or something and they just, you know, freaked out and thought that they saw something unusual. But um, an interesting possibility is that we could be looking at a surviving population of prehistoric animals. So the first one I want to mention um, is called a teratorn. A teratorn is a large bird related to vultures and cranes that lived during the Ice Age up, about to, up to about 11,000 years ago. And many fossils of teratorns have been found in North America, and they had one species, Aeolornis, had a wingspan that was 17 or 18 feet across. And they looked very close to what people are describing in terms of the big bird. Um, another possibility that's less likely is that you have a surviving population of pterosaurs, just like in Jurassic Park. So pterosaurs were flying reptiles, not birds. Uh, the largest species was found in Big Bend uh, in West Texas. Its fossils were found out there and it's had a wingspan almost 40 feet across. It's called a Quetzalcoatlus. But despite their great mass and size, these giant pterodactyls were very lightweight. Their bones were hollow like modern birds and they had a very thin membranous wing. If you think about it, anything that's going to fly through the air has to be very lightweight. So they're not very big and heavy, um, even though they're very large. So that's the story of the big bird, and of course, across the country there are reports of things called thunderbirds, which ties into Native American legends. And isn't it interesting that the Native Americans, many Native American cultures all the way from the Pacific Northwest, to the deserts, to the Great Plains, to New England, all have legends of giant flying things called thunderbirds, which very match the description of these modern thunderbirds or big birds. Um, so yes, and we only have those in North America, interestingly enough. There are no real sightings of giant thunderbirds in other continents, just North America. 
As far as lake monsters and water monsters go, uh, Texas surprisingly doesn't have a lot to offer. Um, nothing like, nothing truly like the Loch Ness monster. Although it might surprise many of you to know that the most, perhaps the most famous Texas lake monster lives right over here in Lake Granbury. And maybe some of you that live here didn't even know this. But there are ambiguous stories of something called one eye because it only has one eye. Um, so the stories are hard to track down, but there were in the past uh, sightings of this one-eyed creature over here in Lake Granbury. Well, my colleague Nick Redfern, who, uh, who unfortunately couldn't make it here this weekend, he came down with a touch of the flu. Uh, Nick was approached by a couple back in 1990, uh, I'm sorry, in 2011, he was approached by a couple from Granbury who claimed that they saw one eye back in 1999 and they actually live in one of the houses on the opposite side of the lake there. And according to this couple, they were out looking at the lake and they were out fishing and they were looking at the lake one day and this giant eel-like animal that was about 17 to 20 feet across began to splash uh, close to the shore and they watched it for about 15 seconds from a distance of about 40 yards. And being avid fishermen, they said, it's an eel, it's a huge eel, that's what that thing is. And it, they only watched it for that span of time and then went back down under the water. So that's the only modern account that I've been able to, to dig up on one eye. Uh, but if some of you want to go searching for monsters, you need to go no farther than the shore of this lake right over here next to us. And maybe if you sit down there long enough and watch the water, maybe you'll see something. Um, in addition to one eye, there are accounts in Texas of giant catfish. Now, how big do you think the, the largest catfish in Texas get? Well, we, we have, yes, we have channel cats and blue cats that can be up to 120 pounds, which is a pretty darn big catfish. But from many of the reservoirs in East Texas specifically, there are accounts of car-sized catfish, as big as a Volkswagen uh, Beetle. And in fact, Lake of the Pines up in Northeast Texas has an account of a giant catfish named Oscar, which is supposedly as big as a car. And catfish, as some of you fishermen may know, typically live on the bottom. So they just kind of, they're bottom dwellers and they're, uh, they eat and they grow throughout the course of their life. So there are giant species of catfish all over the world. The Mekong catfish of Asia, the Wells catfish in Europe, the Goliath catfish of South America. So it's not inconceivable that there are some truly monstrous catfish out there in some of these reservoirs. And of course we have other animals like alligator gars and things that look kind of scary. Um, there are some really old accounts of sea serpents off the coast of Galveston. But those uh, accounts from the early 1900s are rather whimsical. And when you read them, you probably think, well, it doesn't, you know, 160 feet long with stripes and a rattlesnake-like tail that makes a noise. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, back in the early 1900s, a lot of newspaper articles really were fake news. Uh, they basically, they would write newspaper stories to sell newspapers. That was the bottom line. Um, so that's pretty much it as far as the, the water monsters of Texas. Not too much to offer. Um, okay, so let's talk about... Um, black Panthers. Okay, so uh, just a little bit of background here. Um, in Texas, we have two large native cats, mountain lions, puma concolor, and bobcats. Um, and years ago, there were jaguars. In fact, the last jaguar in Texas was shot in the 1950s down, down near Brownsville. It had come across the border from Mexico. But there are hundreds of accounts on record and uh, of people in Texas and elsewhere in the United States seeing giant jet black cats as big as mountain lions. Now, there are no documented scientific um, incidents that involve black mountain lions. All mountain lions that we know of are brown or tawny color. The only giant black cats we have in nature are jaguars and leopards. All black jaguars stem from South America, south of Panama. All black leopards stem from parts of Asia and Africa. So there are no black mountain lions as far as we can determine. So then why are people around Texas reporting giant black leopard and jaguar sized cats running around? Well, 
Um, it's a great mystery. We don't know. Um, one possibility is that there are black mountain lions. And just like uh, you have albino uh, individuals in certain species, uh, you have something called melanism, which is a gene that carries a black coloration or produces a black coloration. So maybe, in fact, there are some black mountain lions and we've just never seen them. That's one possibility. Another possibility is that there are jaguars still coming across the border from Mexico, and some of those are black. Probably unlikely, since the black ones live down near Panama and in South America. Um, there are misidentifications of cats. Maybe people see there are black bobcats, and there's another cat called a jaguarundi, which is a cat native to South Texas, which looks really weird with a small head and a long tail. It's bigger than a house cat. There are also people that misjudge the size of black house cats. I own a black house cat, and they're usually bigger than normal cats. The melanistic gene causes them to be a little bit bigger, and sometimes people see big tomcats running around and think, okay, that's, that's a panther. Probably the most interesting theory is that these black panthers that people are reporting are escaped. Did you know that a lot of people, for whatever crazy reason, like to collect exotic animals? like leopards and jaguars and keep them as pets or keep them on their property. And black leopards are some of the most popular big cats that big cat collectors have or own. And sometimes animals escape into the wilderness and they actually manage to carve out a niche and adapt to their surroundings. Now it might surprise you to learn, because I have a friend that runs a cat sanctuary, big cat sanctuary in Florida, and he told me one time that his friends in the, in the exotic animal collectors, if an animal were ever to escape into the wilderness, that they would not report it to the authorities because then they would lose their license and permit to keep other animals. So the protocol, if your black leopard escapes into the wilderness, is to go out and buy another black leopard and pretend like it's the same black leopard. So that could be scary guys, but there might be some wild leopards and, and jaguars running around there in the wild. Um, Lord knows there are all types of exotic animals in Texas. There's a population of wild monkeys down in Dilly, Texas that were brought over from Japan and escaped. Uh, there was a monkey shot near Coleman, Texas back in the 1980s. Um, I've talked to hunters and outdoorsmen who've seen all kinds of wild exotic antelopes and other animals running around in the wilderness because sometimes they do escape. I recently spoke to a woman in West Texas who saw a giant snake on her property that she couldn't identify. And we wonder if that snake might be an exotic animal that escaped from a collection and so forth. Okay, so I'm going to wind it down a little bit. I'll try to throw a couple more in there that are kind of colorful. Um, not truly in the field of cryptozoology, but I did write a book about something called the Mothman. And I'm sure many of you have heard of the Mothman, which is kind of almost like a supernatural creature because it's a man-like form with giant wings that's been reported in West Virginia mostly. Well, Houston has something called the Batman, and I'm not referring to the Caped Crusader. Back in 1953, June of 1953, three people in uh, the Heights neighborhood of Houston were sitting out on their patio late one night. It was very hot. They didn't have air conditioning, so they couldn't sleep. And as they were sitting out on the patio talking, they saw a shadow go across the lawn um, and something landed in, on the branch of a large pecan tree. And as their eyes adjusted to the darkness, they could make out the form of a man standing about five, six and a half feet tall. And this man-like form appeared to have wings, bat-like wings attached to his shoulders. And what's really curious is that he appeared to be wearing a uniform including a helmet and a bodysuit and knee-length boots. And he was also emitting an eerie yellowish-gray glow. And they watched this figure kind of rocking back and forth on the pecan, uh, a large branch of a pecan tree for a few minutes, and then the light faded out and the thing disappeared. And a few minutes later, according to the eyewitnesses, a torpedo-shaped object shot into the air from across the street. So they called and uh, reported this incident to the Houston police and it appeared in the Houston Chronicle newspaper. And that is probably the only known sighting of what they called the Houston Batman. But it sounds kind of like a Mothman type of figure that appeared. And it was associated with UFO activity because of the glowing uh, torpedo shaped object and so forth.
So Houston Batman is a good one. Another recent one that I investigated that's kind of interesting are reports of living dinosaurs in Texas. I know none of you guys have ever heard of this. Out near Big Bend National Park, they're called mountain boomers. And uh, eyewitnesses who have seen them describe them as being um, about my height, five or six feet tall, but running on their hind legs and having two little arms like this and powerful long tails, basically like a velociraptor from the movie Jurassic Park. So those have been mostly reported from Big Bend National Park. Um, and very recently I wrote about a woman um, who lives in South Texas in a place called Hebronville. Uh, she and her friend both claim that they saw and heard uh, some of these dinosaurs running around Hebronville uh, just a few years ago. And this was published online on a website, and another woman wrote in from nearby from a town called Falfurius, saying that yes, her family had also seen these mini dinosaurs running around on their property, and they were attacking their livestock, and they were very terrified of them. So, probably, I'm personally not going to put a lot of stock into the possibility that there are dinosaurs running around Texas still. But you wonder what the heck people are describing, because they sound like large reptiles or lizards. The only explanation I have is that there are some very large lizards called mountain boomers, for real, uh, that live in Oklahoma and Texas. And these lizards are only about 14 inches long, but when they get scared, they actually run on their hind legs. They pick up momentum and they, they lean back and they can actually run on their hind legs. So maybe that's what people are seeing. <clears throat> so I'm gonna have about a 10 minute question and answer session if you guys have any questions. Respectfully, I'd like to ask that we not, this is not uh, comments and story time. This is, if you've seen something, I'd love to hear about it later at my table. But if you've had a personal experience or seen something or know somebody who's seen something, I'd rather not go into that right now. I'd rather just have kind of some questions that we can address. Yes, sir. What was the most challenging uh, expedition you've ever been on? And a short description of it, you know, logistics-wise, getting to location, doing things like that? Okay, that's a great question. The most challenging expedition or investigation I've ever been on. Um, well, in uh, 2014 and 2016, I funded two expeditions uh, to the nation of Belize in Central America to search for a Bigfoot-type creature known as the Sisamite, and also a pygmy-sized version called the Duende. And um, I basically paid for the whole thing, and um, it was just me and my wife at the time. And it was logistically a challenge, even though Belize is a great country to visit, if any of you are ever looking for a place in Central America. Very friendly people, it's very safe and so forth, they speak English and, and they're very, very hospitable people. But the area we were in was called the Cayo District, it is a kind of a very uninhabited area in eastern Belize. And uh, we rented, a, 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 the Jeep that we rented, essentially, and there's not a lot of rental car options in Belize, so we rented a Jeep, but the tires were basically bald. So I was driving through these mountain roads on red clay and it was basically in the rain and I was like swerving all over the road. Um, so that was kind of scary. And um, when we got closer to the border of Guatemala, we were warned by several people to be on the lookout because there were a lot of banditos running around in the jungle and that they would rob us and kill us and take all of our stuff. So that caused me a lot of concern and stress because I had my young, young wife with me and. You know, I didn't really think ahead that I was going to be pulling her into a kind of a situation where we might be held up at gunpoint and so forth. Um, but it was, it was a fantastic, I didn't really find any evidence. I found some ambiguous footprints, but, you know, just getting around and also, you know, kind of the element of danger. Um, as you get into the jungle there in Belize, you have a lot of jaguars and you have a very, very venomous snake called the Fertilance. And the fertile ants is one of the most venomous snakes in the world. If it bites you, you'll be dead in just a matter of minutes. And you, you don't have access to hospitals and things like that. So, good question though, thank you. What about Swamp Thing? Swamp Thing? <laughs> well, um, I can say that we have uh, Bigfoot creatures that are reported from swampier areas. And one of the most famous of these is known as the Caddo Critter, or the Caddo Creature, which is up near Caddo Lake. Um, on the border with Louisiana near Jefferson, Texas. And it's, a, it's been described as a big, haggy, uh, shaggy, hairy, uh, smelly creature, very similar to the Falk monster from the legend of Boggy Creek, if any of you have ever seen that, and it's pretty close by. 
In fact, there was a Bigfoot movie filmed at uh, Cattle Lake years ago called The Creature of Black Lake, kind of a B-horror movie. Um, but that's probably the closest thing we have to a swamp thing or a swamp Bigfoot. Um, I will add, if any of you are interested in Bigfoot, the Texas Bigfoot Conference is happening next weekend in Jefferson, Texas. And it's one of the premier Bigfoot events in the U.S. There's about three to 400 people that show up. And in addition to myself, uh, Cliff Barrickman from the show Finding Bigfoot will be there, Lauren Coleman, one of the world's leading cryptozoologists, Lyle Blackburn, the guy that looks like me, my good friend that people often confuse me with. So um, that'll be a great event if any of you are really enthusiastic about Bigfoot and want to learn more about it. All right, well, um, I guess I'm gonna wrap it up. I've got a table over here uh, with books for sale. If any of you wanna come talk to me or check out my books or my Bigfoot cast, um, I'd love to engage you. So thanks again for coming out. Appreciate it.